Hi, this is Robin Cassidy and Allison Pilevsky with Creativity Deconstructed, a podcast where we interview artists, entrepreneurs, and disruptors and uncover the secrets behind how these creators turn their ingenuity into profitability. Established furniture designer Thomas Hayes is here with us today, and he checks all three of these boxes. He's one part artist going to great lengths to perfect the unique pieces he designs for his eponymous furniture line, two parts entrepreneur, having begun his vintage furniture dealership in a humble abode in North Hollywood, <laughs> building it up to 6,500 6, square foot studio and workshop in Los Angeles, in addition to a New York location as of 2017, and three parts disruptor, always following his own rules and ignoring the traditional path to success. Thomas inspires us in so many ways, in particular by being a mentor to so many around him. He's always present and engaged, and his extensive knowledge of mid-century design and craftsmanship is unparalleled. Thomas and I met nearly 15 years ago at his first space. We were both starting our careers, and I drove out to NoHo to see some Milo Boffman chairs. When I met Thomas, I immediately liked his upbeat attitude and his inability to not tell the truth. <laughs> I've known that man for a long time, but I want to go backward in time to what happened prior to that moment. Can you describe Thomas Hayes as a young man and the years that led up to the first dealership space? Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I grew up in the East Bay, um, which is sort of like the New Jersey of Northern California. <laughs> bridge and tunnel. <laughs> uh, yeah, very bridge and tunnel. We understand. Um, and... You know, I grew up in a very blue collar family, very sort of low rent neighborhood and uh, school. And I, the good thing is I was around all types of people. The Bay Area is like that. Like we didn't even know uh, about a lot of racial things until we got to high school. We just were with everybody my whole life. So and you so, didn't see the differences in colors. We just didn't. Yeah, it wasn't like an issue, you know, and all the people I went to high school and elementary school with, they have a very similar experience to me or I would, I would doubt it, you know, mm -hmm. but like. It's like I look at my Facebook and, the, the you know, there's a lot of idiots just like me who say the dumbest stuff because we didn't know better. We all played together. We all, you know, liked each other. And, you know, we had to learn what was offensive like in freshman year because we just said all the wrong stuff, you know. So um, and then, you know, I graduated high school barely with like a 1.6. I had like one really good semester. And then the rest of them were pretty bad, I think. Um, and, um, you know, when I turned 19, my life definitely took like a split. And um, I was like sort of on a very bad path and, you know, um, not going anywhere good. And I kind of like stopped drinking, using drugs and got my life together. And I've been on that path ever since. Um, and, you know, I went to college. I was the first one in my family to kind of do that. Um, I majored in philosophy, which has nothing to do seemingly with, with furniture design, but, um, I didn't know I was an artist. I, you know, at all for a long time, I, um, I didn't know really much about myself. I just was doing it. It's like you said, I just sort of have an attitude, a good attitude. And I just do things, um, to, to my own detriment sometimes, but like, you know, I win more than I lose. So it's kind of okay to mess up a lot. But you took a lot of risks. Along yeah, the way. totally. I mean, you know, I think it was Jackson Pollock. Somebody was questioning him and saying, you know, how do you paint these weird paintings with all these lines? And, you know, what if you make a mistake? You know, and he said something like, you have to believe in the mistake mm -hmm. for it to be a mistake. And that when I heard that, it really resonated with me because it's all part of the process. It's all part of the creative journey. And it's just cumulative. It just keeps going and going and going. And everything you do wrong um, becomes the foundation of something you can do well and do right. And, you know, my motto at the gallery, at the studio, Allison's been there, is I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's just make it wrong. Let's make it wrong first, and then we can edit it. And Allison's been there for that many times, like, sitting on it, and it's totally uncomfortable and, like, She's like, ooh, this is awful. Trial. So it's trial and error, a lot of it. You're yeah, saying. totally trial and error. And, you know, like going back, like I didn't know that I was an artist. I, I started dealing in, in mid-century design. I sort of discovered. How old are you at this time? Um, I was like 20, 24, 25 maybe. And I started dealing in mid-century design. And I discovered like what modernism was, Charles Eames and George Nelson, and Herman Miller and all that kind of stuff. What was that first spark, though? Did you see a piece? And I, I did. I was in Hayward, and uh, I was 
you know, I was buying and selling like antiques and stuff on eBay. I like got into this whole like market. I was one of the first, you know, 10,000 on eBay, like when it was starting out. And so, um, I was always sort of savvy with, with that approach, but I, I got this book and it was the only book on mid-century design at the time. <laughs> it was like the only one It said, I think it's called, uh, you know, mid-century modern, what modern was or something like that by Kara Greenberg. Do you know that book? I don't know it. So, mm -hmm. So and I, I saw different things in the book and I was driving and I saw these three Eames chairs on a porch. Mm. And I just like, like me, I just pulled over and w went over to the guy and said, hey, do you, would you sell me these chairs? I didn't know what they were worth. And he's like, well, I kind of use them. And I, I literally, I went and I'd seen some office chairs, like that were in boxes that were for sale somewhere, like for 25 bucks each or 30 bucks each. And I like took three of them back and I said, do you want these ones? And he's like, sure. And I paid him some money or whatever. And they were really good ones. I sold them to somebody in Japan, but I didn't know. I just was like, you know. But you turned a profit immediately. Yeah, I mean, you put yeah. them on eBay and you yeah, made your totally. money back times. No, I, I did good on those chairs. I mean, but it was like, you know, that's always been my approach. Just mm -hmm. ask. So know? then, so then you're 24 years old. Yeah, 25. How do you end up in that space that I came to in North Hollywood with so a bunch of mid-century so, well so i had a place in berkeley that was like a little sort of vintage shop that i had a bunch of stuff in um right next to the campus and during the first like iraq war situation um it was like the whole congress voted to go get the bad guys you mm -hmm. know it was like and we didn't even have a bad guy to get it was just those people whoever they were who you know bombed us or whatever and um so we the city of Berkeley, the one representative in Congress who voted against it was from Berkeley. <laughs> There's like one person. And so the whole Bay Area boycotted Berkeley, you know, and like people love oh. to pretend like they were always these liberal war hating people or whatever. But like, you know, the Bay Area like boycotted Berkeley and our business was essentially over. And so I drove a friend of mine back to L.A. who lived here and I, I was on the 101. It was so random, but I was on the 101 and it, we'd stopped you know, in Sherman Oaks or something, and we were getting back on to go to Hollywood. And I just felt like the vibe here, like there's a completely different thing here from the Bay Area. There's bigger houses that are modern and there's, you know, um, <clears throat> people are, I think LA has this whole rap, right? And it's like, but there's a lot of creative people here, people who like innately creative, whatever job they may have, they are creative people. And I agree there, with that. There's 100%. something beautiful about that, you know, mm -hmm. and I felt it and I felt like, uh, I could really do what I wanted to do here. And I like immediately decided to open a gallery here. And I called my, my then wife and I said, Hey, can we open a gallery in Los Angeles selling fine and decorative arts? She's like, sure. So I like went and sold everything I had mm -hmm. and came and I discovered NoHo and they named it the NoHo Arts District. And But it was kind of really Burbank. It was not. Yeah, no, it was I not mean, the NoHo Arts. It yeah. is now, like right. all these years later, but it was, yeah. I was like one of the first people to believe and like open a store. And it was, awful it was like death i mean it was so far from where anybody who had money to buy those kind of things would go but you know i met people that like i literally have great long-term relationships with through you know like one little piece that they saw and they came and we connected you know and personal relationships are everything well because people know? must have gotten to realize that you had some great finds and then yeah. you create a name for yourself people come back for more and more is that yeah. how it worked yeah, I mean, yeah. And then it's like, I'm so willing to work with people. I think that's always been my attitude. You mm. know? So. Well, you've always had a had a great eye. Um, and... Mila Boffman. I love Mila Boffman. I loved it back then. I think that's but weird. We have some, okay, so that's... the chairs I bought from his studio, too? What did I, I buy from him? I think so. Yeah. I yes. bought when you were on La Sienica. We bought some dining that's, chairs. That's step Probably. two. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, Sorry. that's up a step. Yeah, from... we stepped up to La yes. Sienica. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I want to talk about what you said, because I actually didn't know that you were one of the first 10,000 <laughs> were on eBay. But tw 2001, the start of First Dibs, First Dibs, for anyone that doesn't know, was, is a place that you could shop the world. So it brought all the best dealers all over the world, New York, Los Angeles, now internationally, mm -hmm. and they've expanded it so much. Started by a guy named Michael Bruno. And you were one of the first to really embrace first dibs and put yourself in your product. Cause at the time it's still vintage. It's not your own yeah, line it was yet. All vintage. And I want to know, I guess what, how being, having exposure on that level, like how did first dibs shape, shape your business? Well, it, it changed the whole world, you know, because it was, you know, people still sort of have this myth, 
misnomer about like, you know, where, where did you sell that? How did you sell that? Was it, you know, through the location? Was it on, on your website, on, on first dibs or whatever? And there's no separation, mm -hmm. you know, there's no separation between those things anymore. And it, it wasn't that way then, but we still didn't know that we still were like in the pioneering moments of like, you know, internet stuff. And it did, it like connected me to all these people all over the country. It was a lot like Instagram, I think, is now, but That's interesting. it was back then. It was like I'm connecting with people I would never connect with over, you know, an, um, a piece or a thing or something that like, you know, I'd have something that matched something and I talked to a dealer. And But there was a lot of dealers who were resistant and they thought that it would take away the client dealer relationship that's just and, because their web designers needed work and they were like no no build your own website you can rival first dibs you can be just like them i'll build your website you know like right you know and it was like you know we didn't know nobody knew like what was gonna happen myspace remember that oh yeah yes yeah. <laughs> but i think for the furniture world and the design world like first dibs was the first to do to take all those people and and say we've edited curated all of the things that you know you would shop the entire town for and put them in one location and now you can put in milo boffman chair milo boffman chairs um and everyone who has them in los angeles will show up so you don't have to drive out to north hollywood and then down la cienega and down melrose and i think that did change things so it put sure. you into a different category because a lot of people weren't on it in the beginning and you were yeah that's true and didn't you have to have a physical space? And don't you still have to you, have a physical you space? You did. Now you don't. Now, you now don't. they're okay. really um, corporately sort of run. They're like the Borg kind of. Now it's more about the photography and how good the images are, right? I, don't, I honestly don't. Now I don't so much through first dibs or engage with people through first dibs. I have such a strong connection with my clients, you know, and it's the same clients usually over and over. Um, that I deal with a lot of designers. Designers are everything. So how? Um, what's the percentage of d direct trade versus direct consumer for? I would say ninety percent because to designers, yeah, I would and say. architects. Wow. I mean, I could. I mean, I have numbers like this. Like we do all this work to have these numbers. You know, mm -hmm. I have like a staff of like thirty people, or I think something like that. But like, you know, for me, you know, if I do something with the designer, you know, like their projects change all the time but they are constantly working, you know? So it's like, it's way more important to me to serve the designer than the client because, you know, and the clients don't know what they want. They don't, I mean, clients, people don't know what they want. <laughs> if they could do it, they would do it themselves. Like, yeah. you know, I, I can't design my own house. I ask my designer friends for help. I can, mm. I'm a one piece of furniture at a time person. And even then I have to get help about like colors and blending fabrics and wood. I mean, I ask Alice, I send her pictures all the time and I'm like, does this work? Is that? Mm -hmm. It's stupid looking. So you think there's a difference between a person who designs a piece of furniture and can craft it versus the person who comes in and can pull all the pieces together and give it a look? I think to answer, like, you know, to go to the heart of the matter, I've seen a lot of really cool people who are tastemakers and even like famous and creative and amazing um, have a designer do their house a couple times. And then they go like, well, wow, I know what to buy now and I know I have a good house and I can do this and then they do it and then they call the designer and say <laughs> my sofa is too big I don't right. know what I was thinking like my feet don't fit on my you know ottoman or whatever like you know um can you come save me you know or whatever and it's it's a hard job I didn't really respect designers honestly I thought it was kind of like you know smoke and mirrors until I did some houses myself and it was so overwhelming and hard and I did the Malibu Colony uh, John Lautner house. I walked into that house and was like, what do I do here? This house is perfect. I would have just lived in it with nothing. Mm. Just laid on the heat tile floor and like, mm -hmm. you know, sprawled on the deck or whatever. I mean, it was just, it's overwhelming. To do a beautiful piece of architecture is, in my opinion, is much harder than some, you know, crappy, you know, Beverly Hills mansion. Like, Well, you know. I, I would agree with that yeah. statement. Um, it's also harder to do old and give it a pay homage to what the person who originally designed it intended, I think, than to just come up with, you know, to do a ground up. And that's what I think the difference is for me. I work with all different designers because I have a variation of pieces. Like I have so many different designs, um, but there's designers who curate, I think, and there's designers who just design. <laughs> so how do we go from you, you leave the NoHo space and mm -hmm. you end up 
because I think this is an important stepping stone in, in what you one. said about trial and error and it's a learning. Really good one. Yeah. And so, so how do you get to La Cienega and then? So what happened was, um, I'd always wanted to own a building, like my own building, um, mostly because like my grandfather had a business and it was eminent domain, and like he was in his eighties and he couldn't like start a new business. And I thought that's like really sad that. You know, I wanted to own my own space. I wanted it to be mine and to create it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think I could do it, right? And so I found a space. Patrick Dragonette was in the space, and he was moving across the street. Yeah. So we found a space, um, and we had, like, sort of retreated to our warehouse in NoHo, and we were selling out of the warehouse, even though we were supposed to have a physical space. We were already on first dibs, so nobody, like, knew. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, like, got this space open there, and it was really good. And we had, like, foot traffic and people come in. And then Kelly Wurstler bought the building on the corner of the Craig Elwood building and um, called us and said, you know, I want to rent you my upstairs, which is like the 6,000 square foot space. Beautiful space. Even though it's upstairs, it's just like a beautiful space. Right. And then she's really amazing. I, I love her a lot. And uh, and so I called my accountant, who is just an absolute amazing person. And he like drove right out, had a big old file, you know, thing of all of our numbers and stuff. And um, we're standing on the roof of that building. And I said, can we do this? It's insane. Like, it's like $25,000 a month. And it's like, mm -hmm. but it's like this prime spot. And he said, well, I did the numbers and I added it all up and you can totally pull it off right now. And if you sell $10,000 a month more, you're, you'll be good, you know? And it was like a real moment for me because I said, you know, if, if I can afford $26,000 a month in rent, I can buy a building. Mm. And I like went on the hunt for a building and... You know, but this is like the one thing I'm, I'm an artist, but I'm also like very entrepreneurial. You know, yeah, entrepreneurial and driven. Oriented. Yeah. So, but in in a creative way, honestly, in like the procurement and the the creation of it. You know, I have to like go to other people for how to like actually do everything. Like it's it's awful. So, um, I found a building in in um, Hollywood, Hollywood proper, I like to call it, and Joel Chin was opening uh, near Adam Blackman and Adam Blackman was on, on Highland and it was the far edge of reality. It was like really far out. Yeah. At the time, but, everything was still over on Melrose yeah, and La Melrose Cienega. And Be Beverly and, you know, and mm -hmm. so, so I, um, I found this building and I pulled it off and I borrowed the money from my, my poor mother, you know, a very small amount of money and bought this building that was totally trashed and, and renovated it. And I did the roof and I did the insulation and, you know, um, you know, I pulled it off and then I still had the place in La Cienega um, and I was able to give it up because I didn't need it. But you that's know? when you become Thomas Hayes Studio. That is when I became Thomas Hayes Studio. I actually, um, I broke up with my business partner at the time and he kept the store in La Cienega and I stayed in the uh, studio. And it was right when I bought the building it was right before the economy hit complete <laughs> stop. Mm -hmm. And so I was a genius and then I was like an idiot, like the next you know, six months or whatever. And um, what happened was the way I became a, a designer or artist or whatever was I had some chairs um, that were from Brazil and they loosely sort of resemble my first design. And this restaurateur called and said he wanted the chairs, but he wanted 50 something chairs and he only had $600 each to pay. Um, and I was mm -hmm. like, well, I went and like figured it out and said, can I do this? You know, and I, mm -hmm. I wanted this really cool tool, this German tool. It was like a, a dowel maker. Um, and I was like, you know, I think I can do this. You know, I made nothing. I just ended up with a tool and a cool design. Mm -hmm. um, but I did it because nothing was happening. The economy was horrible. There was no direction. There was no good thing anymore. Desirable trend. It was no trend, you know. And and I made these dining chairs and I pulled it off. And then a designer came in the next week and said, oh, that should be a bar stool. And I was like, mm. boom, made it into a bar stool. And I've sold like 3,000 of those bar stools. You know, and they're my favorite still. My first design is still my favorite to sit is in. Is that the one with like the X on the, there's like one. Yeah, what's the metal? name of yeah, it? It's Which called one is that? the basic bar stool. Oh, the basic. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's yeah. really. Just sent that to someone. And it has day. a swivel mm -hmm. back. So mm -hmm. for like taller men, like, you know, mm -hmm. I like to say that when a couple comes in, the, the man sits in it and goes, I want that. You pick whatever color. I don't care. You know, and the woman's like, all right, let's, mm -hmm. let's play with fabrics and colors and stuff like that. So but out of necessity, you started making furniture more than finding the vintage. Like what did create that so, shift? So it was a bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So then the other thing, big thing that happens, I had this credenza from Brazil. I used to import a lot from Brazil. 
um, and it got completely trashed by U.S. Customs. They just took it and, like, smashed it on the ground. I don't know why. No one ever sees what they're doing, right? But um, I got it back, and it was, like, it was, like, a probably $25,000 credenza, mm-hmm. and it was wrecked. And I took it to all these fancy Antonio. Do you know Antonio, the refinisher, right? Mm-hmm. And all of them were, like, this is gone. It can't be fixed. It's, you know, it's garbage or whatever. And I sat there and looked at it in my workshop, and I'm like, I can't do this. I can't just give up on this piece. And one of my guys was like, hey, we could fix this thing. Let's do it. Let's try, you know? Mm -hmm. And we fixed it, and it looked amazing. But by the end of fixing it, it was so involved how to fix it that we learned how to make a credenza. Mm. You know, essentially, you know, again, it's like deconstructed. We deconstructed it. And when we saw all the parts and how to put it back together, we knew how to make a credenza. So then we're like, well, we should make a credenza. And a lot of times people want... You know, vintage credenzas, but they want their audio equipment to go in it, which is like super annoying, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, because I mean, I, that's the thing about me with design. I don't care if things actually do anything. I just want them to look really cool. Right? <laughs> really, sitting, pr- sitting pretty. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so then I, you know, it has to be like two or three inches deeper typically for all mm. the audio equipment. So I made my first credenzas and buffets and stuff to be for audio equipment. So it was like a progression of pieces, and then little by little, I was adding onto the line. But you've you've referenced a lot of well-known Brazilian furniture makers as inspiration for your own line. And I think some of them are like Joaquin Tenrero and um, Zanini. um, Definitely. Sergio Rodriguez. Yeah, Rodriguez. So so you you went to Brazil and you studied a bit of these pieces and brought some back. And then how how do you incorporate those things that you responded to? in those pieces now into your own line? Like what materials and influences do you see in your own pieces? So I think that I've been asked this a lot, like what is the common thread, right? Of like everything. And like for me, um, Italian design is really the origin of like what I think like sexy, sensual, curvy furniture is, you know? And from Gio Ponti on, I think that that influenced most of the Brazilian designers that are really good that I love are of Italian descent. Mm -hmm. Um, And they brought that sort of romantic, you know, sensualness into their designs, you know. And so um, Brazilian design is typified by like really superior quality uh, materials made in sort of a barbaric way with like inferior construction principles. You know, not Joaquim Tenero and a couple other people, not so much, but most of the big groups of furniture made were just really poorly put together. So when I was restoring the stuff, I was making it better than new, um, you know, but, but the, but the beauty of it is that that common thread, you know, pervades, you know, American design, Brazilian design and European design that the Italians influence so heavily as we all know in every other genre, right. They influence so heavily, you know, with the violence and sensualness of like passion, of too. Yeah, passion. I mean, it's passion. So is that why you've been quoted as calling furniture, furniture sexy? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think you even have a, had a shirt made. I, I think did, I walked in one was, day and didn't understand you won't what wear was it. happening. You said I'm not wearing this. <laughs> so, no, I think that I think that um, you know, it's like you know, women are what made cavemen paint on the walls, right? It's like you know, they painted buffalo and women, right? Because mm-hmm. they were like you know. Um, and it's what has motivated all art is is human beings and our bodies and architecture and furniture is an extension of the human body. So I feel like since we're making things deliberately, you know, um, what I try to do is make it really, you know, complement and fit, you know, into living well, I guess. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, you know. I feel like there's an organic nature to some of your work that I think is also part of the Brazilian aesthetic. And like all the materials you use are, whether it's the leather, or the cording, or the wood and the solid pieces of wood, they're seem so handcrafted. Yeah, I, I would say I overbuild everything, but a lot of that's just neuroses. Like I really don't want anything to go wrong. <laughs> so like I try to like, you know, overbuild it and make it really substantial and heavy and unbreakable and then try to take the edges off. And make mm. it really like work, you know. Allison's helped me a lot. I'm not just. I think you're talking about form versus function. Yeah, right? and just mm. like I overbuild in terms of strength. Like I don't want anything to break. I want the, you know, and, and this is Brazilian. Like Zanini said, you know, you should make things to last 500 years, right? 
So like, why not? Like, mm. why not make something? But what you're saying comes back to personal relationships. Mm. And there's lots of people in your studio at all times that you've taken on and, you know, given chances to. And I just want you to talk about that part of your life a little bit and like how you help because you do give back a lot. And, and I what we keep hearing from people we've um, interviewed on this podcast is this the similarity between they felt someone took a chance on them or invested in them and then they felt they owed it pay it back pay it forward yeah. and you do that a lot constantly i'm constantly is that ever like exhausting or does it ever take so much out of you that you don't have anything left for everyone else i think people think it's going to be exhausting because they're not they're not doing it but it isn't it's supercharging you know and like what it does for me is it it gives me perspective like you know i can't have per when i'm selling 3600 dollar bar stools to people like that's not real. Humans can't afford thirty six hundred dollar <laughs> bar stools. It's it's people who have done really well in life only, mm -hmm. you know. And with their interior designers, it's not like some guy's working. He's like, you know, I'm, I really love that bar stool. I'm gonna have it in my house in Burbank. It's not gonna happen, you know. So when I get in these situations and I'm dealing with these difficult clients who are like, oh, it's supposed to be one inch shorter or taller or whatever, and it's already shipped to New York, I have to have perspective. I have to not take myself so seriously. I have to remember that, like, I'm not Picasso. I'm, I'm like, making things for people. I'm lucky and I'm fortunate. And I cannot keep that perspective without, you know, doing... I've been mentoring since I was 19 years old. To, like, it used to be with teenage boys, and now it's with, like, all types, you know. I mentor, uh, you know, all types. And um, you're right. I've always <laughs> sort of brought people around you, and Allison and me, like, talk about it, and I tell her, you know, people's stories. But, like, yeah. People gave me a chance. People helped me. Like Wayne at Denmark 50, you know Wayne, right? Mm -hmm. Like he helped me and he taught me how to buy a building, you know, and I would go ask people for help and people always help. You know, when the economy was really bad, like, and, and I was losing money, like Bank of America was like, you know, coming after me and they wanted their credit line paid off. And like the guy who was calling me, I'm like, man, can you help me out, bro? Can you like help me with this. I don't know what to do. And he's like, nobody's ever asked me that, you know? Mm. And so because of that, I've learned how to be that way and how to ask for help. You know, I'm always trying to help people and I'm always trying to give them, you know, a pathway to like, you know, what their dreams are and what they want. You know, back to your thing, like, it's not that I don't want money. I want money. I love money. Like I, I really do. I think about it a lot, you know, but like, at what cost? You always have to have your values in line. It can't be money over happiness or money over peace of mind or money over my family or, or my time with my kids. And they're not mutually exclusive. It's not like one or the other. You can blend it, but you always have to keep in mind what's important. You know, are you doing too much? I'm always doing too much. Yeah, I feel answer. like we all are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, when, when, when it's a clear black and white decision and you see it, what do you do? You know, do you say, okay, I'm going to go with the kids tonight and take them out to dinner or should I go work on the house tonight? You know, and it's like, you can do it with the kids, but if you have a black and white choice, make the right choice, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're happier, you're going to, you're going to exude that. You're going to bring it to your work. You're going to bring it to your business and relationships, you know? But I don't think, yeah, I don't think anyone ever goes to their deathbed and says, uh, I, <laughs> I wish, wish I, I worked, worked more. more. Right. No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. But, but you know, it's interesting is like you're you're selling to like the 0.001 percent right i mean you really yeah. are no, what you've said is that your world like your exposure is to you your studio sort of lives in this bubble well so i think the 0.02 percent i think the two percent if you look at the graph they have some millions you know it's like <laughs> it's not as bad as you think you know right. mm -hmm. uh but anyway no you're right like yeah it's true it's true. So it's but, kind of a, a strange world that you live in. Yeah, but you inside know Inside the studio like, of Thomas Hayes. I meet some cool people, man. I meet some people that just happen to have made it, you know, that, that I relate with, that that were creative and innovative and pursued their dreams and they, it worked out. So it's not all like pain in the ass hedge fund. What about know, celebrities? Soulless. What about celebrities? Come on. You, we, we, we know you've worked. We, we know. Let's hear the I hate talking story. about celebrities. I mean, look, I'll tell you. A good celebrity story. That, I mean, there's a lot of good celebrity stories, but they're not all bad people. But, um, you know, a woman came in one time and I, I had a prejudgment of like, oh, she's this blonde actress, like dumb, like whatever, you know. And and um, she was incredibly knowledgeable about materials and about design. And she was like in her late 20s. I was like blown away. Right. And mm -hmm. and she like called her husband and was like, it's my furniture soulmate, you know, and was like, 
you know, and it was um, Blake Lively, mm -hmm. whose mom was an interior designer in Burbank, right? And That's so, like, crazy. she grew up around interior design, and she knows all about it. But, like, you never know with celebrities, like, what they're like until you meet them. And you never can tell from people's online or, you know, on, on screen behavior, like, how they're going to be, how much class they have. So is there a pick, uh, like a particular piece of furniture that you're most proud of or you feel like brings in different elements of what you've learned from the start of your career to, to now, whether it be like, oh, this material works on that, or is there anything you love or that you put in your own house that you yeah, covet? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I have the basics in my house because they're so comfortable and you can make the color of the wood and the fabric anything you want, but like... This bar stool that's in uh, in this wine cellar, I did with Elizabeth Law uh, and Oz Architects and Inga Riemann. Um, it's named the Inga Stool, um, and it you was, always name your pieces after. Yeah, I try to name my pieces after the people I'm doing them with. But they came to me and said, "We have this special house. It's it's a um, you know, I guess it was a Paul Williams house, but they tore it down and then oh. rebuilt it. Hmm. I mean, and it's just it's a beautiful home and." Um, the wine cellar is massive, and the architect was just amazing to work with. And they were like, we have this amount of time. We need these eight stools. Um, and it was a brand-new design, and it was so much fun to do with them. And so for me, like, it's the product of all of our, you know, efforts and editing and reworking it and trying to do it again and again. And, like, um, so I'm really proud of it, and I'm proud of, like, the relationship because it came from my relationship with Law and then she partnered with them, and they ended up doing this, like, amazing house. And to be a part of it is really fun. And then I have that design now, and I've already sold a bunch of them. That was only, like, six months ago. Right. So the collaboration thing is Yeah, it just lives rewarding on. It lives you. on, and then it, it has a story and an origin and a purpose, but then it, it works to solve other people's problems, too. So. Well, what do you hope for your designs for the future? Um, I've always said I just... If, so, if I got $10 million today, someone was like, here's $10 million, you know, what are you going to do? I would do exactly what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't change. God, there's not a lot of people that could say that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would treat the people that work for me a little bit better probably, or I would like mm -hmm. give them, you know, try to help them with stuff that they're doing in their lives or buying houses or whatever, which, you know, but I wouldn't live differently. I wouldn't like go out and buy a Ferrari, nothing against guys who like Porsches or anything, but like, I just... I drive the car I like. I have an old truck, you know. So you're I, kind of in like a state of happiness. It's so unusual. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have conflict and problems. I go to therapy tomorrow morning at nine thirty. Like I definitely do. But like when it comes to like being actualized or like my life, like I love what I do. I love what I do. I love creating the business. I love refining it. I just want to make it better for everyone involved. I feel most happy when the people around me are happy and comfortable too. Mm. You know, and, and it's like that at my place, you know, mm -hmm. the people are really great. They get, they order groceries and we make like a little, family. I made chicken soup today for Jake Arnold actually, cause he was sick at home and I like made oh. a big pot of chicken soup and everyone ate chicken soup and I took him some on the way here. That's very kind. Yeah. That is very kind. He's, he's, you know, he was really sick. We had an appointment to, to design three new pieces and we've been, you know, trying to get together for months and months. And I was just like, this poor guy's missing this appointment and I can make chicken soup. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's nice. Not just for pretty girls. You know, I don't want to discriminate. Mm. <laughs> I've never gotten chicken soup from you. So you must be talking about you. <laughs> All right. So wait, well, can I just go back to one more thing and yeah, back to the furniture origin of how obviously you had found this way to buy and sell furniture and make money first on eBay and then yeah, in yeah. your studio. But how did you fall in love with making furniture? Like the art of that, can you tell well, yeah. us what you love about it? From day one, I remember I got some, like, some Danish modern teak chairs, right? And, you know, my, this is back in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, how do I clean these up? And how do I fix them? And how do I make them look better? You know, so that desire to make things look better or look like they originally looked is what translated into my design ability. It wasn't that I wanted to make things. It was just I was so engrossed in the nitty-gritty you know, how, how things are made and why they're this way and why is this design good? And like, I know a lot about design, about, you know, vintage design, but it's a whole hands-on approach. It wasn't like reading books and going to libraries or museums. It was like buying stuff. It was the doing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, that's what led me to it. I didn't, my therapist and me fought for two years about me being an artist. She's like, well, you're an artist. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm, mm. I'm like, she's like, yes, you are. I'm like, 
why? And she's like, well, look at what you do. And I'm like, yeah, I just make stuff for people. And... But I do think <laughs> that people differentiate between a vintage furniture dealer and a furniture designer that creates his own line of unique pieces that have been clearly influenced by specific periods of time. And yeah. I think there must have been a pivotal moment, and maybe it was what you talked about earlier with, you know, making the chairs. But um, when you turn from being a dealer into an artist, mm. they're different. Yeah, no, definitely. Now I don't sell any vintage anymore. I, like, buy stuff that I don't even have anything to do with because I just love it and I'll have it or whatever. But I don't I don't even remember selling a vintage piece. But you probably make more money on perfecting, like, the your chairs and then selling them over and over, even if you have to make small tweaks on them. Right. Yeah, for sure. It's it, units sold at the end of the day. Yeah, no, it is. And and it's way more rewarding to make my own things. I think, you know, it's fun. Vintage is fun to, to have it and interact with it, but it's not. So know, it's, it's more not, like like design one oh one. Like this is what you like first. And then you kind of evolve into something different. Yeah, for sure. And right, I have a controversial question. So oh boy, <laughs> do you hope that in 60 years, yeah. Your furniture line is shown at Design Within Reach. What do you mean? Like, like they do knock you it hope, off or, or like a... Or that they then license, that you've become the type of designer that they're showing or that it lives on in that way. I mean, yeah, sure. That's like the nature of design. It gets regurgitated or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. It gets redone. Like, I don't know. I mean, I just make things to last 500 years. I make things the best way I can. And like, if those designs endure and people want them still you know that would be great or i mean sure that would be super cool i mean yeah but you get knocked off right i mean so when you get knocked off like is it you're flattered or you're fighting words pissed I mean, well because it's gotta I be definitely go into designing something thinking about how hard would this be to knock off and most of my stuff is not easy to knock off mm. unless they send it to china and then it would just be so obviously bad Nothing against China or whatever, but like they just, <laughs> they don't make things well. They don't, I don't even know if they have the right material. Well, I think they're making quantity. Yeah. Versus... But like, you know, like that stool, the Inga stool, making that bronze upper piece and that round cushion, it took me weeks of cutting material over and over to like figure out how to do it right. And it's incredibly hard. Mm. It takes like three. But cheerily... you're doing it from scratch. They can buy your model and knock it off. And that's what people do. Yeah, I know. I guess so. Mm. But it's still really hard to make it the way I made it. I, agree I make with it that. solid wood and mm. I wrap a little piece of like, you know, right. I make things as difficult as I can <laughs> mm -hmm. so that it's so hard to knock it off. Mm -hmm. You know? But see, like this piece looks super functional to me. It has everything that I want in a stool. It swivels, it has yeah. a back, it has a pad. Those are like, it's very hard to find stools that do that. So when you yeah. say you don't care about function, I would take, No, I do. I just, I'm like, I'm driven to like, really like how something looks. And then I have to get help from people. You mm. Like, there's a small tilt, a one inch tilt that wasn't there. And it feels completely different. Mm. You know, so I get it to the point where it looks how I want. And then I call people in and we start messing with it. And like, cut the back legs down a little bit to give it that tilt. Or do we prop the seat up? I mean, I like, I work on stuff for months. Mm -hmm. I had the bed, the law bed. I had a model in my showroom for a year, mm -hmm. just sitting there with rope all in it and like looking at I think it. That's and the bed it. that you were saying. You oh, like I love that bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's named after Elizabeth Law. Oh. Okay. But she, she never even bought one of them. It's funny. <laughs> it's just like, you know, you know, I asked her a question about it probably, you know, like, but it's, you know, getting it right for a simple thing is so hard. Mm -hmm. Getting it to look right, you know. Got well, um, well, this podcast is based out of Los Angeles, a place that many dream of and transplant themselves to try to make it big. And we've noticed a familiarity or similarity in a lot of the guests that we've interviewed. They dream big. They think bigger. They map out a course and they pursue it with passion. None of this happens by accident, but with a lot of hard work. And of course, a little Hollywood luck never hurt anyone either. <laughs> That's true. So um, thank so, you for joining us here absolutely. on Creativity Deconstructed. Absolutely. You can see Thomas's work on his website at www.thomashayesstudio.com, or you can visit his LA showroom at 6162 Santa Monica Boulevard, or if you're in New York, in the Tribeca neighborhood. 50 Hudson Street. Okay, oh, perfect. Amazing. Um, I'm going to go to your studio in LA. We have to go visit together. It's a great experience. It looks That's beautiful. Fun. I'll make you chicken soup. Oh, I would do that. Oh, that was 
make it 11 more worth it great (laughs) well thank you so much and uh yeah thank you thank Thank you you guys